Welcome back everybody to our studies in Edexcel A-Level Global Politics. This lesson is going to talk about the problems and issues associated with the dealing with human rights and the enforcement of human rights from an international legal perspective. So the previous lesson and the previous couple of lessons, in fact, spoke about the origins as well as the development of international law, as well as the development of international legal institutions, the creation of the ICJ, the ICC, the special ad hoc tribunals for the former Yugoslavia and, and Rwanda, as well as the European Convention on Human Rights. This lesson is going to talk about the issues that are associated with the difficulties um, in, in, in enforcing basic human rights provisions within international human rights law. So obviously most people should uh, come to the conclusion that human rights enforcement is a very important part of the global community's activism in ensuring that in ensuring that human rights are respected and that human rights are treated um, with the level of severity that is necessary for everybody around the world so with that being said what are the difficulties that are associated with enforcing human rights enforcing the basic provisions of human rights around the world well, this relates to less the legal implications, because as unfortunate as it is, we are not studying international law in this in this series. We're doing we're doing a level politics. So we're going to be focusing less on the legal implications, although still with a with an eye to with an eye to the, the, the legal implications. But but more so focusing on the geopolitical implications, talking about the ways in which global politics is essentially structured in such a way such as to make it difficult for there to be a strong and accurate and foundational basis for the enforcement of international human rights law. Specifically, we're going to examine the concept of state sovereignty, how this challenges the enforcement of human rights, as well as the lack of enforcement in general, and then finally looking at the geopolitical and domestic political implications that are associated with this particular topic. And so beginning first then, state sovereignty is one of the core principles of the international legal system. One of the core principles of international law is the idea that states are sovereign. And so this means that they are considered the ultimate authority within their own territories. And so the principle can conflict fundamentally when it comes to the enforcement of international human rights, because states may resist the external interference in what they perceive as their own internal affairs. If there is allegations, if there are allegations of human rights violations taking place within the domestic territory of a member state, then that member state in question may wish to challenge any external actor, any non-governmental organization, any international institution like the UN or the Security Council or anything like that, or even the International Criminal Court for, for alleged violations of, of, of international criminal law. And so essentially the the idea here is that states reflect that sovereignty and it feels like at the very least there is not that much that can be done about the idea of state sovereignty um, the principle of non-intervention prohibits other states or other international organizations from just directly interfering and intervening in the internal matters of a sovereign state so it's quite difficult because what this essentially does is hinder efforts to address human rights violations, as states may argue that such issues are purely the domestic concerns of that state. And so it is not the realm of the international community to deal with such um, issues. Now, there is a very good book that... I wouldn't recommend you read as an A-level student, but if you're somebody who wants to go and do international relations at university or maybe even go and do international law at university, there's a good book called The Geopolitics of Shaming 
about the ways in which and the circumstances in which the shaming of international human rights violations actually helps the um, uh, help states to essentially conform to human rights and when it actually doesn't. And there are circumstances in which international shaming, divesting and boycotting of certain states does have significantly strong geopolitical implications and it does lead to uh, an alleviation of human rights violations. But then there are also situations in which the shaming of states for their human rights violations causes those states to dig their heels in and continue uh, and, and become more and more isolated to the rest of the world. So it's a very difficult thing to balance. It's a very difficult issue that needs to be balanced. And it is one that is not necessarily done in a particularly effective way. In addition to the principle of state sovereignty, you also have to think about the fact that there is just a general lack of enforcement of, an, of a great number of, of human rights obligations. Unlike domestic law, which would be enforced by a national police or a national judicial system, there is no global authority, there is no global power, there's no global police force with the power to enforce international human rights laws uh, in uniformity across all states. If a state has signed on to an international human rights treaty, then there might be instruments in place which allows for alleged violations to, to be to be recognised by a judicial organ. So, for example, uh, the International Court of Justice could, could intervene in contentious cases, or uh, an individual could sue their state if they're a member of the European Convention on Human Rights, if they're a country within Europe. That could also be a method for which um, the, the enforcement of human rights can take place. But it's not particularly that effective in the long run, in, in, in its entirety. Because essentially what this means is that enforcement will rely on the willingness of states to comply voluntarily. Again, very difficult and provides something of a limitation for the enforcement of human rights globally. There are also limitations when it comes to that of international courts and international institutions. The image here represented is the International Court of Justice. While international courts such as the ICJ or the International Criminal Court um, do have jurisdiction over treaty bodies of the uh, of human rights natures and and of of, of such uh, of such ideas uh, as that, um, their jurisdiction and enforcement capabilities are also quite limited. One such example is that the fact that a state must consent to jurisdiction of these bodies, and even when judgments are issued, enforcing them might be challenging without the cooperation of the state involved. Uh, a, a good useful illustration of this can be seen in the in how long it is taking for the arrest warrants to be issued by the pretrial chamber to the International Criminal Court for the issuances uh, for the issuance of arrests uh, for individuals involved in the current Gaza war, with 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 a number of Israeli officials being accused of of war crimes and crimes against humanity, and a number of Hamas officials, uh, some of which have already uh, died, in fact, um, also being accused of war crimes and crimes against humanity, and. This was uh, something that took place many months ago. The 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 uh, the prosecutor of the ICC uh, went to the pretrial chamber to to request arrest warrants, and and they are yet to have been granted. Finally, then, what are the political considerations that are involved in uh, enforcement of human rights? Well. Enforcement of international human rights will often depend on the political will of states and international organisations in that enforcement. In many cases, for example, there are geopolitical interests, there are various geopolitical alliances, there are various economic considerations which may take precedence over their human rights concern. Even though in a sane world of, of moral thinking individuals, it might not be the case that human rights should uh, essentially form to the back of the queue when it comes to alliances, interests and economic considerations, this is unfortunately the world that we live in. It seems to be the case that where these things uh, may take precedence, it seems that there is a either the selective enforcement of, of human rights concerns or potentially the inaction of human rights at a global scale. 
the UN Security Council, for example, which does have the authority to, to make actions which are binding on sanctions or military interventions, is often hampered by the power of the veto that is held by the five permanent members, by the US, China, France, uh, the Russian Federation and the United Kingdom. We noted this in the previous lesson when we looked at the UN Security Council, that that is fundamentally a difficult thing to reconcile when it comes to the enforcement of human rights. If, for example, the Russian Federation or one of her allies is alleged to have been violating uh, international human rights standards then the UN Security Council is rendered effectively meaningless because the Russian Federation will always veto a resolution on that on that matter. Similarly, the same case can be made for the US and the UK. And if we want to draw again back to the current Gaza war, and we want to think about um, the, the cause for a ceasefire um, on the part of the UN Security Council, it took many months before people actually, uh, many months after people were requesting a ceasefire for the UN Security Council to actually pass a binding resolution resolution on such a matter and that only took place with in relation to the United States abstaining from the vote and so that's an example of an, an ally to the US and to the UK also um uh, being alleged to have violated various different human rights norms and, and principles of human rights law, um, again, failing, um, uh, the UN Security Council failing to actually uphold the, the basic standards of, of international law because of the fact that they are allies to the US and the UK. The same could be said for Russia when, it, when we talk about her invasion of Ukraine. Same could be said to, uh, relating to China and the alleged violations of, of the rights of Uyghur Muslims in the, in the Chinese state. All of which clearly shows that there are political considerations which often take precedence over human rights concern. The result, therefore, is a prevention of the council from taking action against human rights abuses if one of the permanent members has either a political or a strategic interest in the state involved.